Now, let me finally introduce uh, our colleague, Joshua Fischer-Birch, who will do the third and last presentation today. Joshua Fischer-Birch is a researcher and content review specialist with CEP, where he focuses on the extreme right, including online communications, propaganda, and social media. He has written about extremist content, ideology, and trends in the far and extreme right. Joshua has a master's degree in international affairs, specializing in international security from American University School of International Service and is a frequent commentator in the US and in the international media outlets. Joshua, great that you're here. You're joining us from New York today. I'm very much looking forward to your presentation on the US reaction, the violent extreme right uh, uh, US reaction to the conflict in uh, the war in Ukraine. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Hans, and uh, thank you so much to my fellow panelists, uh, Casper and Alexander, and uh, thank you very much as well to uh, Darlene, who's doing uh, the tech side for today. Uh, so, okay, so looking at the reaction of the extreme right U.S. extremist scene uh, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, so kind of just starting off with some pre pre invasion aspects uh, really uh, neo Nazi accelerationist groups have historically viewed the conflict as an opportunity to exploit their own ends. So members of the Adam Waffen division and affiliated movement members uh, have viewed some extreme right groups in Ukraine as allies and have seen the situation in the late 20 teens as an opportunity to gain training. Uh, prestige and experience. In the early days of the Adam Walton division, uh, members have Joshua, communicated- there is a ton of interference. I think your your microphone is rubbing against your shirt or something. It's oh, quite, am, quite loud. I am terribly sorry about that. No worries, uh, is, no worries. Is this better? Absolutely perfect, actually. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much and apologies. Uh, so in, in the early days of the Adam Wathen division, uh, members had communicated with individuals in the Azov movement on the Iron March web forum in 2015. Uh, the American James Mason, a leading ideologue in the American neo-Nazi accelerationist scene, uh, has claimed that members of the Adam Wathen division had previously trained in Ukraine uh, and returned to the U.S. as part of this you know, training prestige experience pipeline. Uh, in January 2022, a Telegram channel linked to Mason and the successor to the Adam Waffen Division, the National Socialist Order, uh, encouraged their supporters to travel to Ukraine to join units affiliated with, with the Azov movement. Moving to uh, the base uh, in 2019, uh, the base's founder, Rinaldo Nazaro, uh, spoke internally about using the conflict in Eastern Ukraine as a training ground for members we then share that experience and connections made with, with their fellow base members in the US. And a member of the base, Ryan Birchfield, uh, joined the right sector militia in Ukraine, uh, was deported from the country in October 2020, along with an alleged member of the Adam Waffen Division. Uh, looking at sort of these non accelerationist groups as well, uh, the founder of California's Rise Above movement, Robert Rundo, uh, had traveled to Ukraine in 2018. I greatly admired the Azov movement for creating kind of a counterculture that he hoped could be emulated in the United States. And then in addition to that, you have several other propagandists and online influencers in the extreme right who, before the invasion, have, have expressed moderate support um, for, for groups in Ukraine. And this is kind of mixed with some skepticism regarding the conflict, uh, mixed with anti-Semitic conspiracy theories regarding to what extent the warring parties were being controlled uh, by, you know, by secret groups or interests in their view. And whenever tension rose between Ukraine and Russia, uh, there were frequently individuals as part of this kind of online or extreme right influencer community who would claim that this was a false flag to distract people from other global events. Uh, and then in addition to all of this, there were small isolationist pro-Russia anti-NATO elements in the American far and extreme right, such as the white supremacist anti-Semitic National Justice Party um, and elements of the, of the group, the Proud Boys who have supported isolationism that kind of factors into this, this broader, broader environment. However, kind of post-invasion, uh, 
neo-Nazi accelerationists refined their positions on the conflict after, after Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, the neo-Nazi blog linked to James Mason and the National Socialist Order stated that they're opposed to both Ukrainian and Russian governments. They were very clear about, about specifying this and that while they supported the extreme right in Ukraine, uh, they really predicted that the Ukrainian government would collapse in the near future. This was in late February. Um, and they hoped that this would lead to a wider anti-Russian insurgency in Ukraine and along the border, uh, which would then present opportunities to foreign fighters. And you know, the, the refining of their position also was a delaying tactic on their part, uh, where they stated you know, it was necessary to wait until the situation got worse and more chaotic before they could endorse full participation. And on March 2nd, you know, the website stated that their readers should not travel to Ukraine. Uh, they said this was due to their audience's young age, many of them being teenagers, and lack of military experience. And instead, the site encouraged sending cryptocurrency to extreme right groups in Ukraine. The site has continued to state that a civil war will eventually occur in Ukraine. Uh, with, they, they claim this will be exploitable. Uh, to them and groups similar to them. And they've claimed that, you know, friends of the website um, are currently fighting in the country, but they haven't backed this up with solid evidence. But following the invasion, the base's founder, uh, Ronaldo Nazaro, who notably lives in St. Petersburg, Russia, uh, has stated that American white supremacists should focus on working towards collapse in the US. Uh, he stated that Ukraine was not their fight he said they should not participate in a, quote, NATO proxy war. And Nazaro has specifically told current and former members of the base uh, they, they themselves should especially not fight in Ukraine uh, because this would draw attention to themselves from law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And the Active Club movement, which emerged from California-based Rise Above movement, has supported the Russian neo-Nazi hooligan and MMA fighter, Denis Nikitin, who was previously mentioned, uh, who has lived in Ukraine for several years. And active club propaganda has for the most part advocated support for members of the Ukrainian extreme right. However, at least one local chapter in Indiana has voiced support for Russia. And in late March, the main active club blog stated that the group should not be divided and instead they should focus on more local issues in order to preserve movement unity in the United States and stating that their positions on the war in Ukraine should be personal and should not be public. And then some individual propagandists, notably a New England based neo-Nazi streamer who has several thousand Telegram followers, uh, changed their views shortly after the invasion. Uh, so this individual you know, previously expressed moderate support for Americans to join extreme right combatant groups in Ukraine. Uh, so the polls on, on the right side of, of the slide uh, were posted on this individual's Telegram channel, uh, suggesting that American white supremacists should not get involved in a foreign conflict and should instead work towards destabilizing the US. Uh, you know, additionally, posts blame the U.S. and Jews for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Many American online propaganda channels that had previously voiced minor support for Ukraine uh, reverted back to the slogan, no more brother wars, in an effort to emphasize support for white people as a whole, rather than one specific side in, in the conflict. And the slogan also suggests that nefarious forces, often portrayed as Jews and anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, are responsible for global conflict. Uh, there's been little change with the pro-Russia element in the United States. Um, notably, several chapters of the Proud Boys used media interest uh, regarding foreign fighters as an opportunity to troll journalists in the US in late February and early, early March. So, Kind of looking at what, what explains this shift. Uh, in many cases, prior support uh, should be viewed as opportunism and not internationalism. In many cases, pre-invasion ideas of using Ukraine as a training site by American accelerationist groups, were really you know, opportunism in order to gain experience and training and not an indication of long-term allegiance to the region. When the situation changed and it became significantly more dangerous and more of a commitment, many of these groups changed their minds. Uh, betting from Ukrainian authorities, language barriers, and the brutality of the Russian invasion also likely played a role in, in this shift. 
Uh, groups in the US do not want their limited members, admirers, or loose networks to be killed or wounded overseas. They want individuals who can return to the US and train others in order to build more capable violent movements. And suggesting that individuals instead send cryptocurrency or purchase goods from extreme right Ukrainian brands has kind of been a way for propagandists in the US uh, to encourage a, 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 you know, a minor sense of involvement while remaining stateside. Additionally, there has been this need to enforce unity uh, amongst you know, several American extreme right movements. Uh, so some movements, such as active clubs, realized that more of their members either had sympathy for Russia than they had previously thought or viewed Russia as a counterweight to the United States. So active club affiliated media as well, uh, and some movement chapters have gone have become closer over time to pro-Russian extreme right elements in the US, such as the National Justice Party. Uh, this is something that that occurred in specifically in the media space, uh, where these two groups moved a little bit closer together. And continued strong support for Ukraine could imperil the active club project as a whole. So falling back on this no more brothers war slogan concept, um, stating that unity amongst groups in the United States was paramount kind of functioned as an off ramp to lower tensions. Additionally, uh, the focus on the US, uh, many propagandist groups and movements in the US have encouraged their followers to focus really on the US domestic situation and have stated that involvement with conflicts overseas just won't improve the situation in the US. Additionally, uh, you have mainstream US support for Ukraine. Uh, so many individuals in the American extreme right scene view themselves as anti-system rebels. And overwhelming US popular support for Ukraine after the invasion makes this image more difficult for them to maintain. And so while there's been support for the Ukrainian people uh, amongst some in the extreme right, um, others have really derided mainstream American support as either a distraction from domestic issues or a push for war in Europe. And uh, thank you. <laughs>